So today, I want to try to tackle the question. So we talked about having a biblical perspective about money. We talked about the challenge of overcoming the spirit of mammon. Today, I want to try to tackle the question of giving and what does giving look like and what should I give? What should I give? Proverbs 11, 24, 25 says this. It's a key principle here. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. What should I give? What does being a generous giver look like? Prop Solomon in his wisdom poses a question for us. And, and he says that there's a person who gives, but yet he ends up getting more. See, the world says, if you give, you have less. See, that's the spirit of man and lack. Well, I, I can't give because if I give, I have less. But God says, no, no, if, if you give, you'll have more. But then he says, but there's someone, another withholds unduly. What do you mean withholds unduly? In other words, they don't give what is right. Mm. They don't give what is right. And they eventually come to poverty. So let's explore this question, this thought of giving and what is unduly? And that leads us to this question, the truth about tithing. The truth about tithing. I've heard over the years a lot of comments, a lot of conversations about tithing. And in, in preparing for this, I did a lot of studying on different beliefs and views about tithing. And there's a belief out there. There's a teaching out there that says tithing is Old Testament. And because it's Old Testament, because it's in the law, tithing has no place for New Testament believers. There's, there's, there's a teaching out there. There's, there's a belief out there that tithing is Old Testament stuff. And because it's Old Testament stuff, and because it's in the law, it's not relevant for us. That's interesting when you think about it, though, right? So let's see some Old Testament stuff. Let's see here. Um, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for good, not evil. Plans to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future, to bring you to an expected end. We like that, don't we? But hold on, hold on, that's, that's Old Testament stuff. That was under the Old Testament covenant of law. That can't apply to us today. Let's take the whole book of Psalms. That's Old Testament stuff. That's under the law. Why would we even read that? Why would we even claim some of the promises that are in there? Because that, that's Old Testament stuff. It doesn't affect or have any place for New Testament believers. See how ridiculous the argument is? It's a ridiculous argument on his face. I find that most people who make that argument are people who don't give. They're people who don't give. I don't believe that spiritually mature Christians look for a percentage to give. They don't look for ceiling or floor for giving. Rather, their giving is an expression of their relationship with God. 
It's not a question of old or new or relevant, right? Then you hear this, then you hear this. Well, the Bible doesn't command us to tithe in the New Testament. And it doesn't. It doesn't. The Bible doesn't command us to tithe the New Testament. But you know what the New Testament also doesn't do? Doesn't tell you not to. Doesn't prohibit. If there are things that God don't want in the life of a believer, he is expressly stating it in the New Testament. So it's not a question of is it Old Testament thing or New Testament thing? I think those are arguments made by people that don't really understand what tithing is all about. They think tithing is about money. And because there's been so much manipulation and so much abuse in the church as it relates to money and giving, because whenever you read these teachings and these blogs, it always ends up back to that. So we want to bring some clarity to this question about tithing. Here's the first point I want you to, I want, Lord, help me. See, because some stuff, some, some stuff, you can't catch with a pen. You know what I'm saying? I toiled in trying to catch this. Some stuff you can't catch. Some stuff has to be received and discerned. It is a rama impartation. And I hope you get this. Tithing was before the law. Those all the tithing is up. Tithing was way before the law. 430 years before the law. Abraham tithed. Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils that he received from the, from the battle of the slaughter of the kings when he ran into Melchizedek. Melchizedek, who is the great high priest, a type and pattern of Christ, met Abraham, and, Abraham, and Melchizedek gave to Abraham bread and wine. And as a result of receiving the bread and wine from Melchizedek, Abraham broke him off a little something. Abraham gave him a tenth. Jacob, 400 years before the law, Jacob vowed to give God a tenth. When Jacob was asleep and God came to him in a vision and reinforced the covenant that he gave to his grandfather Abraham about the land and his descendants. When Jacob awoke, awoke Jacob vowed, Jacob said, Lord, you gonna bless me like that? I'm gonna give you a tenth of all that I possess. What is interesting here, all this was before the law. What is interesting here, there is no command to give, but they gave a tenth. There's no command to give, but they gave a tenth. Where did that come from? Where, where, where did this inclination, where did this, this, this understanding, where did this practice come from of the giving of a tenth? Well, in doing some research, it was a practice in ancient times. It was a practice when, when the lesser received of the greater, the lesser to acknowledge what he had received of the greater would give a tenth. The giving of a tithe, the giving of a tenth. And the reason why it's a tenth, because it's significant because 10 is a number that represents the fullness of a circle, the completion of a cycle. It is a representative of the whole. It is a representative of the whole. It is a representative of the whole. If I can't give God a tenth of my heart, he'll never have all my heart. It's a representative of the whole. Tithing was before the law. It was a practice that was really about the acknowledging of the receipt of a blessing.
Don't the Bible, New Testament say something like this? Let each of you store up in the beginning of the week according to how the Lord has blessed you. Watch, watch, watch. Watch this. Now this, watch this. So where did they get this whole idea of tithing? Where did they get this value for the tenth? I found this interesting. The tithe is about a tenth. We think it's about money. The tithe is about a tenth. The tenth is given as an indication of the whole. The first person to tithe in scripture was God. Just, just you gotta catch this man. You, you gotta catch this. Noah was the 10th generation from Adam. And so what did God do? God looked, he said, man, the whole world don't lost their mind. The, 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 these angels that came down, they sleeping with, 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 with man. They, the heart of man is continuously wicked. I got to start this whole thing all over again. I'm going to wipe it all out. And the Bible says it, God repented that he had made man. It didn't mean that God said, man, I should have never done that. That word repented means he had a heavy sigh. You ever notice like when your kids do something stupid and you're like, <sighs> that's what God did. And so what did he do? He took Noah, who was the tenth from Adam, to represent a whole to represent the new man that he wanted to create. He tithed Noah unto himself to create a new seed. When the flood waters receded, when the flood waters receded, what did God say to Noah? God went to Noah and he said, Noah, I ain't gonna flood the earth no more. Give you rainbows a sign, all that. But then he said this, he said, Noah, as long as the earth remains, there shall be seed time and harvest time. Noah was an agrarian. Noah was a vegan. Man didn't eat meat before the flood. Noah knew if I plant something in the ground, I get a crop from it. He says, as long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time and hard time, harvest time. Just as there's going to be winter and cold and just as it's going to be day and night, you can bet that there's going to be a perpetual principle in the earth of seed time and harvest time. What God was saying was, Noah, I've sown you unto myself to reap a seed. Abraham was the 10th generation from Noah. Not the 7th, not the 11th, not the 12th, not the 5th, the 10th. There's something in theological studies that's called the law of first mention. That the first place something is mentioned in scripture, it establishes a principle for how that thing is interpreted and applied throughout all of scripture. So that we see God tithing Noah to himself to create a new seed. Then we see him tithing Abraham unto himself. Why? To create a new people. To create the scarlet thread of redemption. To preserve for himself a lineage in the earth through which he could bring that promise he gave to Adam and Eve in the garden regarding the seed of the woman. And he had to secure a people unto himself to do that. So he chose the tenth from Noah. Now you might say, Dave, that's just coincidence. That, 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 you, you, you stretch it down, brother. You're making stuff up. But the law first mentioned, God was the first one to sow a tenth to reap. Tithing isn't about get God getting your money. Tithing isn't about the church getting your money missing it.
you're missing it. See, tithing is about this eternal law of sowing and reaping. It's an eternal principle, the law of sowing and reaping. All throughout the scriptures, you see this principle of sowing and reaping. If you sow to the flesh, right? Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. You find out in the Old Testament, sowing and reaping. I'm giving you a choice. Life and death, blessing and curse. Choose, choose life that you and your seed may have. All throughout the scriptures, we see this principle of sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. Tithing isn't as much about somebody getting your money as much as it's about you understanding the principle of sowing and reaping. In order for God to be able to reap, even he had to sow a tenth, a tenth in Noah and a tenth in Abraham. It is the law of sowing and reaping. It is an eternal principle. Now let's apply this principle of sowing and reaping to giving and the New Testament pattern and principle of giving. Because I'm gonna stipulate this. I, 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 I'm gonna stipulate this. Look at the person next to you. Say, neighbor. neighbor. You don't have to, you don't have to. tithe. You don't have to. You don't have to tithe. Just like you don't have to be faithful to your wife. But you'll reap the fruits of it. So just put it out there. For those of you on Zoom, you folks going to be watching this, because I'm surprised at the number of people that watch our YouTube channel. For all of you folks that, that, that are going to watch this, listen. You don't have to tithe. You're right. It's not a commandment. You're free to keep your money. Now watch this. Sowing and reaping. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 are probably the most complete portions of Scripture in terms of the model for New Testament giving. If remembered in our first teaching, we looked at eight and how in eight they gave out of their poverty. And the reason they gave out of their poverty, it says because they gave themselves first to the Lord. Again, if God ain't got your heart, he ain't never gonna get your money. They gave themselves first to the Lord. And because they gave themselves first to the Lord, it says they were able to give above and beyond what they had. Not only did they give above and beyond what they had, but the text says they begged for the privilege of giving. The privilege of giving. You see giving as a privilege, you see it as a burden. But watch this principle. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Watch. How much we sow determines how much we reap. The question is, God wanted to reap something with Noah. So he sowed proportionately. God wanted to reap something with Abraham, so he sowed proportionately. The question isn't, what do I, what, what must I give? Is it 10%? What, 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 what I gotta give? Uh uh. What is the question being asked here? Look at this. What's, what's the question being asked? The question is, what do you wanna read? What do you want to read? You, you want to reap a little? Go and sow a little. You want to reap a lot? Go and sow a lot. It's up to you. So here's my question. What do you want? 
What do you want? Watch this. Verse 7. Each one must give how? As he has decided in heart. See, it comes back again. Giving isn't about money. It's about our hearts. And this verse speaks that there needs to be this intentionality about giving. Give as he has decided or purposed in his heart. Not in his head. Not in his checkbook. In his heart. The heart is the place, it's the thing that I'm asked to surrender to God. The heart is the seat of my affections and, and my emotions. The heart is where the conflict, the battle between God and mammon rages. And what we're being asked to understand about generosity and giving as a mature believer, I'm talking about mature believers, is there has to have an intentionality in my heart to win the battle over mammon. It's a decision in my heart. And why is this so important? Come and say this again, because I can't give beyond my commitment to and my value for God. See, what I purpose in my heart about giving is a reflection of my value and attitude about God. A heart dedicated to Christ cannot help but be generous towards God and his people. See, we're talking about spiritual maturity. See, if you're fighting this and you're resisting this, it just simply means I ain't mature yet. I, I, got, I got some room to grow. I, I got some ground to make up. I love this Nigerian proverb. We talked about this the other week. It is the heart that does the giving that hands only let go. The law of sowing and reaping which is what tithing is all about, begins with what do you want to reap? If you only want to reap a little, fine. Then just sow a little. You want to reap a lot? Sow a lot. But do it according to how you have purposed in your heart. It's a heart thing. It's not a checkbook thing. Now watch, verse, watch the second part of verse 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. <laughs> not reluctantly or under compulsion. Listen, this, this, is, this, is, this is really, really important. It is an individual choice that's based on conscience, and a person's own relationship to God. Can't make you, can't guilt you into it, right? Because your giving can't be arm twisted, can't be out of guilt, can't be reluctant, right? Remember when we first started, we used to actually take offering? And I used to always say this, and I've said this to people for years. If you can't sow that seed in faith, keep it. It'll do us some good, but it won't do you any good. You won't get any fruit out of that seed that you've sown. This, this ideal of reluctance, it's, 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 it's shown to mean unwilling and hesitant and, and, and disinclined, right? Like, like, like a lot of us grew up in church where you had to come up to give the offering. I always felt that was manipulative because now if, I'm, if I don't go up and I'm just sitting there, now everybody going to know. Right? So you walk up, I'm going to throw you a little $2 in there and go on by. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, 
or grudge, some of your translation says grudgingly, it indicates a reluctance or resentful manner. Hear God, take it. Or you hear people say, I pay my tithe. Like, when you pay something, that's, that's an obligation or a debt, right? I, I, I pay my mortgage. I ain't happy about paying my mortgage. I ain't happy about my car payments. I ain't happy about paying my gas bill and my light. I, I ain't happy about that. I, I do it because I have to. You don't pay tithes. You sow. God looks at the character of our giving. God evaluates. Hey, think of it this way. Ever go to a restaurant and have bad service? They bring out the plate to you, just slap that joker on down, just, just right, just like, yeah, just, right? And you be like, well, I'll see you come tip time. You ain't getting, you ain't, you ain't getting no tip. Because it's the attitude. God looks at the attitude. See, it's not about what percentage. It's not about is it old, is it new. That's an immature conversation. God looks at the attitude of what we bring. He looks at our motivation for giving. Remember Ananias and Sapphira. They gave a lot, right? Sold some and lied about it. But they gave a lot. They gave a lot. But God looked at their motivation. And when they got called before the leadership, they said, why has why, why the devil prompted you in your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? When it was with you, wasn't it yours to do whatever you wanted to do with it? It's your choice about giving. You're not commanded to tithe. No, you are not. It's your choice, but you're not commanded not to. It's your choice. How do you want to reap is how you sow. God looks at the attitude of our giving. Abraham and Jacob didn't tithe because they were commanded or because there was a law that required it to be sold. They tithed, they sold to honor God based on his blessing. We are quick to stick our chest out about what God has blessed us with and how God has blessed us with that and how God has blessed us with that. And, but then when it comes to honoring that blessing, then we want to go and find, oh, it ain't, it ain't the law. It ain't, oh, it just didn't do the way you are. You die. Yeah, yeah. Are y'all seeing this? Am I making any of this up? Is any of this unbiblical? All right, I got to get out of here. See, see, the reason why it's important that we give according to how we purpose in our heart and not reluctantly or under compulsion is because God does not want financial hostages. The New Testament model versus the Old Testament model is, 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 is a, it's, it's a principle of have to and want to. See, there's so many things in the New Testament that we do, not because we have to, but because we want to. The Old Testament was about have to. I have to do this in order to be accepted by God. The New Testament is all I have to do is have faith in Christ and I'm accepted in the beloved. Now everything else I do isn't to gain God's acceptance. It's in response to his blessing. You see how it's not about law? Oh, mm -mm. That's an immature conversation. God wants us to be willing to give because he has our hearts. Not because we have to obey some kind of external commandment. God loves a cheerful giver. Watch this verse here. Proverbs 3, 9 is, is a really important principle here. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits from all your crops. 
the first fruits, a tithe. Remember, tithe is representation of the whole. Honor the Lord. See, giving is about honoring God. It's about the worth, the value for God that I have in my heart. If the worth and the value ain't there, strike out the rest. Just, it's, just, it's just that simple. And I know, I know, I know. We want to think, come up with all these other things to talk about, that we want to rationalize to ourselves about how we, how we love God. And yeah, it's not really about that. And it ain't really about money. No, this isn't about money, is this? This is about honoring the Lord. It's about my heart. That's why Corinthians 9 talks about giving as you was purposed in your heart, giving according to what you want to receive. It's honoring God. Tithing isn't about money. It's about honoring God. You don't have to tithe. You don't have to give. You don't. But if you want to honor God, he has a pattern and principle for what that looks like. Lastly, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says this. It says, God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. The word cheerful doesn't just mean happy, but watch this, but one who is prompt and willing to do so. One who is prompt and willing to do so. Giving is an exercise of the heart. It's not about money, but about our worship of God. It's about what we truly value, God or mammon. And we give as a reflection of a heart that is appreciative towards God for his blessing. That's why Abraham gave, because Melchizedek blessed him with bread and wine. And his giving was in response to that. Jacob gave because God blessed him with the expansion of the covenant to Abraham. And so as a result, he tithed, he gave a tenth that was reflective of the condition of his whole heart towards God. A cheerful giver is one who is joyous and happy because he recognizes that all that I have is because of the goodness of God. And I'm not giving 10. I'm being allowed to keep 90. Now watch this because because I got to get out of here. See, this whole thing started, right, about tithing isn't about money. It's about the law of sowing and reaping. Now watch verse 8. Oh, God wants us to use our money as something holy, something that we need to offer to him in worship to God. I can't say I'm worshiping God, but then I'm keeping all my money to myself because my money is tied to my heart. That's why we're all into our houses like we are. We're all into the car. Look at where you invest your money. That's where your heart is. Now watch this. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. I got to get out of here. So he's telling us all this, right? And then he says, and, continuation of thought, God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times you may abound in every good work that's a lot of all i mean not to get theological i think that says if you give he got you covered Watch this. He's able to make all grace abound. 
All grace. See, the, the oh, I got to get out of here. Um, we, we, we've made, in order to manipulate people into giving, we've made it about, well, if you sow five, God will give you ten. Right? We, we've made it like that. We, well, that it, 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 it's like a, God's a casino. He's a roulette table. But watch this. Lord, help me. He is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things. In other words, we have so many needs in our lives that extend beyond finances. All grace. Grace is divine enablement. Grace is divine power. Grace could be the wisdom you need. Grace could be the strategy you need. Grace could be the patience you need. Grace could be the favor you need with somebody on your job. Grace could be a relationship that you need to get hooked up with to open a door to the next phase, the next season in your life. All grace that our giving releases all grace. It opens up our lives for God to be able to bless for God to be able to move so that all grace, so that having all sufficiency in all, what you need. Sufficiency is, what do I need? Where? In all things. What do you need in your life? Because again, what do you want to reap? What do you want to reap? If you think it's just about money, you're going to miss it. Let me ask you right now. Do you need some sufficiency? Yes. Do you need some sufficiency? Yes. Do you need some grace? Are there areas in your life where you need some grace? Where you need some enablement from God? Are there areas in your life where you've met the task, you've met the moment, but then sometimes you fail to meet the moment? Because he says that sufficiency is in all things at all times. But it's all released by your sowing. It's all released by your sowing. We don't understand it, do we? We've missed it, don't we? Church has taught it wrong for years and it's right there in the text. So you may abound in everything. My sowing of a seed is driven by what I want to reap. If I understand that what I have the ability to reap is sufficiency for all the areas in my life, then maybe in my sowing, I might want to do just a little bit more than sparingly. Maybe I want to just do just a little bit more than sparingly. Maybe that means that there ain't no percentage. It ain't five. It ain't ten. It's according to how you want to reap. How much sufficiency? How much grace do you want? How much do you want to abound in good work? You know what this reminds me of? Bring all your tithes and offerings into the storehouse and see watch this he said prove me test me test me and see if i don't do what yeah. open the yeah. windows of heaven and do what yeah. pour out a blessing on you you ain't even got room enough to contain it. not only will i pour out a blessing on you but there's this thing that been a, that's been assaulting your life called the devourer the thing that's been eating up your relationship, the thing that's been eating up your sense of identity and security, the thing that's been eating up your finances, the thing that's been eating at your health, the thing that's been eating at the goals that you have for your life, the thing that has been inhibiting you from advancing in your career, the devourer. He said, I'll put him in check on your behalf. Don't that sound like this? Don't that sound like this? So, so, so how do young people say Bump me with that. That's Old Testament stuff. Bump me with that. Again, that's an immature conversation. What do you want to reap? I got to get out of here. Brother James helped me see this. I shared this thought 
with Brother Flagger a couple of weeks ago. And immediately, this popped up out of his mouth. So thank you, James. So, so remember Cornelius? Watch this. So, so, so let, me, let, me, let me read this to you. So Cornelius was a Gentile, but he was a giver. He was generous. Watch. And an angel visited him, and the text picks up. And when he observed him, Cornelius observed the angel, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he, the angel, said to him, watch this, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before me. See, God watches our giving. And God sent an angel to say to Cornelius, Cornelius, boy, I've been watching you. I've had my eye on you. And your giving has moved me. And it's moved me so much to the point that I'm going to send an angel to you. And what the angel did, he said, verse 5, now send men to Joppa and send for Simon or Peter, right? So because his giving, it released grace. And the grace that it released for Cornelius was that God sent an angel to tell him to go and search for Peter in Joppa and bring him back. And when he brought him back, Peter was able to share the gospel with Cornelius and those in his house, and they got saved. His giving released grace that allowed the gospel and salvation to come to his house. What's not coming your way? Because you don't want to give. What's not coming your way? Or maybe it's coming, but it ain't coming quick enough or fast enough because you're sowing sparingly. And so you will reap sparingly. God will always honor a generous heart. Always will. The question of giving for New Testament believers, it isn't about how much. It isn't about Old Testament, New Testament. It isn't about have to, want to, can't, should. It's all about what do you want to reap? God was the first practitioner of tithing. He didn't tithe the money. He tithed the tenth which represented the whole. In his tithing of a tenth, he reaped unto himself a seed through Noah. He reaped unto himself a seed through Abraham. Our tithing releases seeds of grace into our lives. And it's according to the measure of what you want to reap. Do you have to tithe? No. What do you want to reap? Let's pray.